I, I hope this is working, yes. I'd like to welcome everyone to this round table with the very intriguing name, I Make Art, and raising the question, is there a contemporary transformation of art systems and meanings? The easy answer is yes, but that's not where we're going to go. We're going to go to the harder answer. And so I'm, uh, in, I will wait a moment for everyone to be able to sit down, but I, I see everyone is sitting down nicely. And uh, I would like to uh, say a few things about this round table. Um, the, the round table asks very, very complicated questions. Is the, con is the contemporary arts world rapidly becoming a leisure commodities global market? Which kind of art and which meanings have to be expected? In which direction are evolving the main art institutions? Is the meaning of being arts productor changing? Artists, gatekeepers, scholars will confront their point of view about the transformation of contemporary arts under the new market conditions. The action of the gatekeeping actors and structures, the emergencies of new ways of collecting. And I point out that this, this paragraph speaks of evolving arts and the, I think one question will be, is evolving the best word? Maybe it would be revolutionizing uh, instead, but we'll find that out by the time we get to the end of this session. Um, I will start by telling you who are the participants, and uh, let me start by introducing, on my right, Francesco Bonami, who is Artistic direction, Director of the Fondazione Sandretto Re, I hope my, my, my pronunciation is correct, Ribal, Ribaldengo Perlar, uh, who helped in the organization of the round table. He was uh, the director of the 2003 Venice Biennale. Fran Francesco Bonami, curator of the 75th Whitney Bien Biennial of the American Art in New York this year, and is artistic director of the Fondazione uh, per l'Arte. Uh, per l'arte in Turin and of the PT Imagine Discovery in Florence, as well as curator of Aerial Contemporanea since 2007. And I had to point out that uh, because of my long Chicago connection, I will only say that he was uh, for some long time among his many curatorial activities. Uh, senior curator of the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, uh, and uh, I, I can also mention that his editorials appear regularly in uh, a number of the leading newspapers, journals, and art uh, works, uh, uh, journals, uh, uh, organs in Italy, and uh, he lives and works in New York, where I hope to have occasion to see him. Uh, in the future. Secondly, because uh, we are also interested in seeing what artists have to say, Xavier Villan, who is uh, sitting on my left, uh, comes from, uh, was born in Lyon, France, but uh, he lives and works in Paris. His work includes the mediums of photography, sculpture, film, painting, and installation art. And whether he uses digital photography, sculpture, public statuary, video, installations, or even the art of the exhibition, Xavier Vellian builds his work around the same axis, the possibilities of representation. And uh, I will let him speak for himself rather than go through his very long and fascinating uh, 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 CV, uh, but we will be talking about that later. Uh, of the people who are not artists, uh, I will introduce Emanuela Mora, who is sitting 
further to the right, Associate Professor of Sociology of Cultural Goods at the Faculty of Political Science of the Catholic University of Milan, where she also teaches consumer behavior and cultural consumption. She is a member of the board of the Center for the Study of Fashion and Cultural Production and is a member of the Scientific Committee and the faculty of the Milano Fashion Institute. Uh, further participants include Volker Kirschberg, who is sitting further on my left, who is an art sociologist at the Lufana University in Lüneberg in uh, Germany, northern Germany, uh, who has done empirical studies of the reception of artists in what he calls a real art exhibition, uh, which he says is named, I Made Art, Is It Art? And uh, beyond that, I will also say a few words about the rest of the, this panel, which includes uh, some people whom you know well by now, Annalisa Tota, who is sitting very far to the right. That does not refer to her political position by any means, and uh, you know her well, and uh, will continue to know her since she is here in Milan and, uh, and is the main organizer of what is going on at this wonderful conference. Um, and um, Victoria Alexander, who has just arrived from England, who is uh, uh, teaching, Dr. Alexander teaches at the University of uh, Surrey. And she is to my, further to the left. And finally, I think finally, uh, to Stefan, Stefano Baia Curioni, who is sitting on the edge of the platform. Uh, and uh, I would now uh, ask that all of us think about this very challenging um, paragraph that uh, I read, and again, I, I feel that uh, I'll simply say that uh, Stefano Baio Curioni is, as you know, Associate Professor of Economic History at the Bocconi University and uh, Vice President of the ASK Research Center here and the local organizer of, the, of this conference. And we owe him a real debt of gratitude for being willing to participate in this conference round table because it is in a, uh, a huge uh, piece of work that he has been engaged in uh, and uh, yet we, we rely on him for guidance and for his opinions. So um, at this point I'm going to start by asking Xavier Vellian to speak. To give his point of view, followed by uh, 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 in order in in the order in which I suggest Francesco Bonami afterwards, so, and then we'll go through the panel. Okay, I, I have imagined. That would be wonderful. Are you? You have them. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Hello. I'm sorry to not to speak uh, in Italian, and I'm sorry to have a very bad English. But, uh, uh, so I'm an artist based in Paris, in Paris, and uh, I was quite interesting uh, with the idea of this uh, conference in an uh, ec economical university because uh, today I'm uh, running a small uh, team, and I'm in the middle of. Uh, uh, I'm working with a team of eight people at the studio. And uh, so my work in the last 20 years changed quite a lot, and the situation of the art world changed quite a lot also. Show, I will show you a very fast a few images so you have an idea of my work. And... Um, 
Mm, I will, I'd like to comment only a few images. Uh, you have also a small booklet that I brought with me. Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't carry more than 20 of it. Uh, this is a booklet that people had for free when they were visiting the Versailles show. Uh, there is a program in Versailles, in the Versailles castle, that started three years ago with Jeff Koons. I was the second one and just opened uh, last month uh, Takashi Murakami's exhibition. Uh, I th I'm quite concerned with those, um, with those kind of shows and I will go to the uh, images of the Versailles show. And then, sorry. Um, because uh, today, contemporary art, that was something completely um, out of the uh, economical field, is uh, turning to be a kind of uh, important incomes uh, in terms of uh, how it can bring people to, uh, for example, a place like Versailles that everybody knows, but nobody has really a reason to get back to. And the, the, even the controversy on making shows in, um, in, in, in uh, classical places is a, something that is uh, spotting uh, new uh, interest on 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 those uh, and bringing a lot of people in. So I tried to make a show that was exactly what I don't know if you can can you read also the uh, it's a little bit small but anyway um, I made my show so that it was very open and accessible to the a broad audience but without any uh, compromise. So it was kind of radical show in a way. And um, that's what I try to do also in public spaces. For an artist in my position, I'm doing museum shows and gallery shows, but sometimes I try to uh, get to a broader audience. And um, this, is, this was the occasion because uh, almost two million people saw the show, or I, w I should say passed by because uh, the degree of attention is not very high, but uh, it's something interesting, I think, to uh, be confronted to this uh, broad audience. Here are a few images of a piece called The Architect that was in front of Versailles on the left side of the image and on the right side, uh, La Femme Nue. And this is inside the castle. It's only a few samples, actually, of the show. And this, those two last images are on, on my, uh, it's, it's my studio in Paris, and it's empty, but you, as I said before, we are a few uh, people working in there. And the studio is uh, quite important for me because I'm, uh, if I compare myself to the same generation, my friends like uh, Philippe Pareno, Pierre Huyghe, uh, Maurizio Catellan, uh, Karsten Holler, uh, Angela Bullock, they almost never had a studio, and I'm a studio person. I think it's very important. And I guess uh, the period we are in now is uh, almost like a new um, renaissance, um, which means that there is a um, uh, seek for art and uh, need for art, but um, maybe uh, Mr. Pinot and Mr. Arnaud in France replaced the uh, Medici, to say it very short. And um, I'm interested in the idea of the studio of a, as a small company and how I can uh, make uh, my own way in the economy. Uh, dealing with uh, a lot of pressure. Uh, art basically is based, the production of art, of art for me is based on uh, desire, uh, the desire of the artist to see the piece existing or the exhibition existing. And on the other hand, there is a pressure of time and the pressure of the economy and uh, interaction with uh, all the actors of the art field. And the idea is how to get this energy, how to use the energy of the real 
to uh, bring it somewhere which is halfway between real and and fantasy maybe I think uh, maybe uh, I would be interested in answering question later on and uh, I just want to point the fact that uh, uh, since I'm 47 and I started here with my first show at uh, Radio Goni Galerie Faximile in 89 and it's funny because it's like it was another area in, in art and uh, no um, I'm interested in seeing that the art is uh, something that even people only dealing with the economy are interested in because the amount of money uh, is something that turned to be um, important now. Uh, and I, I'm, I, I think it's a, it's a new situation which uh, I think artists uh, have to deal with. Uh, good, good afternoon, and um, I make a little premises uh, talking about the changing of the uh, transforming art world and uh, it's, it's, uh, commodities and uh, leisure. I think there are two different uh, f level of the art world. There is the one that is a luxury market, that is uh, uh, a market that belongs to very few, few people, I mean, uh, and very few artists. And then there is a, a, another level that is the one of the exhibition, the biennials, the old the, the, uh, e exhibition uh, uh, tour that is a completely different, uh, not different, but is a, is a, a work parallel to the, to the market structure. Sometimes, you know, they are, the two things connect and they are influenced to each other, but there are two different really levels of uh, to read these two things, you know, the, the um, has always been like that, you know, uh, art has been always, in terms of market, something that, that uh, of the interest of, of uh, as, as Xavier Yan uh, said, about people, kings, uh, uh, prince, uh, popes, uh, uh, industrialists, oligarchs, and a very, a very few small amount of uh, people are the one that interested in, in in the art and this very small amount of people are usually interested roughly in a very limited uh, number of artists and and then there are all the others <coughs> that that participate to the discourse and the discussion but they don't you know participate to the, the to to the, the the luxury luxury business but the question is if the the, the art system changed in the last, uh, I don't know, 10, 20 years, and it definitely changes. And uh, I, I worked, uh, start working in the, in the art uh, business uh, since, as a curator, I would say uh, 20 years ago. Uh, I was an artist shortly before, so since 25 years are involved, I am involved in the <coughs> art system. And it changed uh, dramatically uh, for many, many reasons. Uh, the visibility, the, the, the contemporary art has become more and more a tool for uh, promotion of cities, nations, and, uh, and uh, local administration. They need, they need to do uh, programs about contemporary art because it's, it's what uh, people uh, are interested in and they see as a, as a tool to, to talk about the future. So since the time I start, you know, the, the, the player are uh, immensely uh, multiplied. And, uh, and I remember that when I start, we were still, the, the fax was uh, a, a kind of a wonder machine. We, we before, when I started, there were no faxes, and uh, and and then when I, when the faxes come, uh, it looks like it changes radically the way to communicate, you know, and uh, that was like around the 90s. It was, I mean, amazing how you know we were totally 
in awe of this machine that will allow us to write articles and send them over immediately and see them. We didn't even could even think about internet and, and web, uh, uh, the web and all, and all the rest. Facebook and Twitter and BBM and all, all everything we have today. This, this radically changes also the way we work as curator, you know. Uh, faxes was one thing, and then when, the, when they started communicating through email uh, and the web, the thing completely changes the way we work. We, can, you know, we were able to organize exhibition traveling, but not traveling as much as we are traveling before. We are able to have information immediately about artists and, and uh, also uh, we have been spared, so I don't want to say in front of an artist, but as curator we have been spared of many studio visits that we would have done, uh, and a painful studio visit. Uh, now with the internet we can see when an artist is really good, or, I mean, we, it looks good, and when someone is bad, you can see also through internet. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's avoid us to uh, the, the horrible confrontation with a, a bad artist. And that's, I think, it's, it's extremely important because, you know, uh, there is always the, the artist that sends you the message. I would, it would, I cannot, you cannot really see how they look through JPEG. You should see them in person. It's not true. They look, if they look bad, they look bad also on JPEGs. And, and if you go to see them, usually they look worse. Uh, I, I, that's my experience. Very rarely, you know, uh, the only thing you cannot see on the on JPEG is the Tino Segal uh, work, uh, but they can describe it on the phone, and uh, you can understand what it is. So uh, it changes. I, the, my first uh, project that I did was uh, to say how it changed the, uh, the system. <clears throat> was in 1993, I was curating a small section of the Venice Biennale in the, in the, in the Corderia, the, the, the section that uh, was called Aperto, uh, devoted to the young artist. And uh, at that time we were working on a shoestring and I remember in my section where I invited people like Charles Ray, Paul McCarthy, Rudolf Stingel, if I remember well, Matthew Barney, Gabriel Orozco, then there was a few that they disappeared, Carter Custera, Jessica Diamond, and, and uh, uh, Christine Oppenheim, I think those were the artists. Um, that was possible to do this, you know, here you have Charles Ray, Paul McCarthy, Rudolf Stingel, Matthew Barney, and Gabriel Orozco that would never accept an invitation today in the Aperto. And uh, if they would accept, they, it would cost, I think, I, being a conservative, between 100 and 150 times the budget that costed in 1993. <coughs> um, and that time was possible because, I don't know, there was less communication. At the time, the competition between artists was uh, if an artist has two uh, uh, spots on the work, the other artist won three and the other artist won four. That was, they were competing on, on voltage. Today they are competing in, uh, uh, can't say anymore, you know, in... Uh, uh, Lumen, or uh, in, in they are competing on level of technology that is very expensive. They are competing uh, in hotel stars. Uh, uh, they are competing in business class and uh, economy class, in taxi and and uh, limousine. It's it's a very it changes immensely. Uh, at that time, was not even a question. So today, I would would not be able to do the same exhibition. Uh, not because these artists are famous, but because also the young artists uh, behave, rightly so, as famous artists. Uh, and I think it's important for an artist to believe in what they do from the beginning and not, not just uh, behave like asshole when they become famous. I think it's good to be an asshole from the beginning of your career 
because it's uh, it's it's important, you know. Uh, and and yeah, it's it's very. Uh, I think it's extremely. Uh, uh, it's coherent and. Uh, and I know many artists that look like good people at the beginning of their career, but they were really asshole, and they reveal it when they became successful. I, I prefer people that are really bad from the start. I, I know who I'm dealing with. Uh, in 19, and three years after, I curated another show in 1996 with the Fondazione San Vettore Ribodengo in Turin at the Galleria Civica. Uh, there were 11 artists, and now I do the, uh, I'll make the list. And uh, that exhibition, I think it costed, at that time, maybe all included 50 or 60,000 euro. Today, that ex the exhibition, and I will tell the, the name of the artist, it would not be possible, first of all. And if it would be possible, it would cost probably around one million, one million two hundred thousand dollar or euro, whatever. Uh, that show had Maurizio Cattelan, William Kentridge, who I think for the first time was in a, an exhibition in, in Europe. Doug Aitkin, Pascal Martin Tayou, Thomas Demand, Philippe Arenau, Rick Ritiravanijan, Tobias Reberger, Mark Dion, Sam Taylor Wood, and uh, Sara Chirachi of, of this, this art. Um, at that time, in 1986, all these artists, you know, I still remember, you know, William Kentridge was willing to move the wall where he was uh, supposed to be his work by himself. Everybody was uh, uh, on a different spirit. And today, not because of the, these artists, but today you know, the, the game has changed completely. The visibility changed, the, the stakes are higher, and so artists, rightly so again, they need to be presented in the best way and, 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 and uh, uh, in, in the best uh, circumstances. At that time, you know, these artists, they didn't have assistant or they didn't have anybody you know, to help them. They were doing the work by themselves. You know, I remember Tobias Reberger building these vases with his own hands in, in Torino. And, uh, uh, and, and it, was, it was fascinating. It was a kind of uh, different world. Again, today, this, a kind of show like this would, would be un unthinkable. Uh, space, artists are very demanding about, at that time, artists were not demanding about space. They were not demanding about technology. They were not demanding about certain thing that today, rightly so, they, they demand. And, and uh, this changed completely the game. It, it's a bigger production. It's almost like doing a movie to do a big exhibition. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's a challenge that the artists take. Even when a young artists, they are in big demand, they, they want to be presented in, in the best way. And, and uh, they make, the life of curator very difficult, but that's that's our problem, not their problem. So, so thing changes. The economy changed. You know, uh, I remember also the economy of, of acquisition as as for for a foundation or for a museum. Before we could, as a foundation or museum, buy a young artist for a very decent amount of price. Today, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's very strange how the psychology change. We were much more sure to buy, at that time, uh, work that were not expensive. Today, uh, it's, it's, uh, you start buying when the price is already high. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's very strange how it changes. Uh, it's very hard to find very, very young uh, artists that are inexpensive. They, they already start with a certain level of, of uh, when they enter in the circuit, in, if they enter in the system, they are, uh, they are expensive for the standard of 1996, not because the change of the value of the euro, but it's, it's in psychologically, you know. And, um, and this make, makes more difficult the, 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 the work of public institution or even semi-public institution. 
the museum in particular, they have very, very hard time today to, to buy a work of art if they don't have a, a, a collector that uh, can uh, buy it for them. And today, collector, very more rarely, they give uh, works to a museum as gifts because, again, the stakes are higher. I remember when I went to Chicago in uh, 1999 that I convinced a collector in Chicago uh, uh, who owns the Jeff Koons Rabbit. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with the system in America. A collector can give a partial gift to the museum in terms that you know, they can give 30% of the value of the work to, to a museum and, and uh, keep the 70% of the value of the museum, of the work, and, and, and they can have the work at their house and have to show it in the museum at least 30% of the time of the year. I convinced this collector to give 30% of the Kunz rabbit to, 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 to the museum. It means that uh, the collector cannot sell it basically anymore. A collector can, that gives 30% of the works cannot sell it and they, they could, but nobody would buy because 30% would be always belong to a museum unless it's very unlikely that a museum agrees to sell the, the, the share of the work of art. At that time, to, to see how, how things changes, we thought uh, this collector bought for $900,000 uh, Jeff Koons Rabbit. 1999, we're not talking of 50 years ago, you know? 1999, so 900,000. We thought that the guy lost his mind when he told us that he bought the, and, uh, the Jeff Koons rabbit. And uh, for some reason, he agreed to, to give it to the museum because at that time in 1999, there was not this craziness about the market. Today, it would not be possible to convince him to give it to the museum. For the simple reason that uh, uh, what he has in his hand uh, cost uh, I don't know, because it would never come on the market, uh, something like that, but something in, in the realm of 50 million or 60 million works of art. It means that uh, if the, you sell it uh, privately, you can keep buying, you can be, be the player in the market game, you know? Uh, in, in a way that you could not be before, you know? If, even if we thought that $900,000 was an absurd figure in, in 1999, it was not as absurd as 50 million. And if you have 50 million, you can play a big role in the market game. And, and that's what stimulate is like Viagra for a collector. Yeah, it's, to be able to buy works of art is something that is uncontainable frenzy. And, 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 and now a collector knows to have such a value in, in her possession that very rarely they would give it to a museum because they want to be player, you know. Once they give it to a museum, nobody go to dinner with them any longer, you know. Uh, that's a big problem, you know. I wouldn't go to dinner with the guy uh, of the rabbit if, you know, if he didn't own the other 70 percent. I had to go to dinner. But if you were, you know, it's a sad story, but that's true. Your know, collector are uh, very uh, uh, often boring people that are, uh, uh, you know, they participate in the social life only for that simple reason. Either they, because they buy art, or either because they give it to a museum. You know, once they don't buy and they don't give it to a museum anymore, they become boring and, and <laughs> all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> wonderful people become extremely boring. <laughs> But if you go to dealers, you know, they tell you about people that you would never want to spend five minutes of your life before that are one fantastic people. And they are so fun, you know. Uh, artists, in, they have to endure uh, long evening with... Uh, uh, and that's why I think we have to praise artists for two things. For the fact that they, they being an artist is extremely difficult uh, activity and a very lonely activity you are by yourself and you are facing. And also because, you know, as much as they want to be uh, outsider, outrage, once in a while they have to really spend time with unbearable people uh, because it's the people that make them living and everybody has to do that, you know? 
we have to do as curator. We make less money than artists, and so it's even more painful than, than to be an artist. But <clears throat> you know, in Chicago, which is the second most boring co town in the world, I think. Uh, pardon uh, me, except for architecture. Yeah, but you know, I, yeah, I know. But uh, once you have seen the architecture, you have to stay inside the architecture with people that can destroy. Uh, one evening after the other, in, 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 uh, on, and you have to stay there because you hope, as a curator, that eventually they will give money or uh, art to. Well, you're you're driving me to ask questions. Please go and ahead. I, no, no, no. no I, I finish. I, 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 because I, could, no, no, I don't, no, I don't have a. I will restrain myself. I don't talk uh, with the I logic. Think, I think. Oh yes, it's very <laughs> logical. Uh, I think that uh, it's time to move to the next uh, the next uh, participant, the next panelist, M Manuela Mora. Thank you. So my contribution to this roundtable could sound quite asymmetric, since I'm not an art scholar, but I'm a fashion scholar. So the main question, which happens to be the topic of this roundtable discussion, that is, where is going the art world? Which are the most innovative paths where art will develop in these years and during the next ones? So this, this question has to be anticipated by another question, the answer to which can't be taken for granted. And the, that question is, can fashion be considered as a part of an art world? The question is obviously too big to be addressed in the short time of this contribution. Too many terms should be defined and clarified. Even the debate in the field of fashion studies has been controversial for many years. In fact, from the second half of the 19th century, when uh, fashion, modern fashion began to establish itself in France. Here I can only try to elucidate very rough the framework and then try to enunciate some points that are, uh, in my opinion, worth becoming the field of next work and research. The leading journal in the field of fashion studies, that is fashion theory, devoted to the topic of the relationship between art and fashion, a series of articles in the late 90s when it published a large review by a Korean scholar based on a, a survey of American art magazine articles devoted to fashion criticism. The essay was introduced by a clear question. Is fashion art? The answer, of course, was not as clear and unequivocal as the question, but the conclusion of the author could work as an introductory background to the current discussion today. She concluded that fashion has become a subject recognizable within the postmodern art world because of the broadened conceptions of art and fashion. Other contributors to that debate in the late 90s had outlined some of the features of these broadened conceptions. I would like to mention three of them that seem important to me, even if I don't have time to focus on them. First one, the essential aspect of fashion is its visual impact, of course. Visual impact is highly important for art, too, but the difference seems to lie in the depth and complexity of the applied codes and expected readings and deciphering practices. While in fashion, people are searching for immediate gratification through colors, materials, forms, uh, through the aesthetic surface of objects, in the perception of art, this superficial pleasure is only the first level reading, followed by a second one, in which the art lover, as well as the connoisseur, can appreciate the work itself, not only because uh, of the pleasure they feel, but specifically because they recognize the style, the aesthetic codes, the historical legitimate context where the piece of art can be located. The second features of uh, the relationships between art and fashion could be the commercial nature of fashion, 
that has been outlined as one of the most challenging points in the relationship between art and fashion. As I have read from the in the program of the conference, this is a topic in the research and thinking on contemporary art too. And Francesco Bonami confirmed this point uh, just now. One of the questions introduced in the round table was, uh, is the contemporary art world rapidly becoming a leisure commodities global market? So I guess that uh, um, one of the grounds, because fashion has a, pla has a place at this table, is that fashion is both creative and commercial in itself and represents a field of activity that can exemplify how contemporary art could work nowadays. The third uh, character addressed by scholar 10 years ago as a field of resemblance and difference between art and fashion had been the type of creative attitude fashion designers apply in their work in comparison with that of authors who work as artists. The debate we were referring to distinguishes between at least two different levels of fashion work. That of designers creating collections of uh, unique pieces, haute couture designers, and that of designers working for the pret-a-porter fashion, a sector of the fashion production that is industrially organized. Pret-a-porter is based on a very intense work of projective, innovating, aesthetic inspiration de developed during the phases of creating the new collection. But afterwards, the production is a serious production, a confirmation of the analysis conducted by Benjamin about the artistic world in the age of mechanical reproduction. And this is, uh, that could be uh, a problem. So through thinking path that I can't make explicit here because I don't have time, I'm trying to raise three points from the features now referred to. The first one that I call semiotic saturation. In the field of fashion, we are nowadays experiencing a sort of semiotic saturation. Lots of brands located at every level of the consumption pyramid, from the level of mass market to that of luxury global brands. Every brand tells its story through images, ads, words, in order to convince people about the novelty, beauty, usefulness, uniqueness of the world of meanings it is proposing. But due to the enormous number of brands, the, specific, the specificity and qualifying differences of most brands are not really perceptible by people. People who are always more used to selecting and choosing and mixing different fashion items in order to perform their images. I think that this phenomenon has at least two big consequences. The first one acts at the level of perception. Too many distinctions and too many resemblances among brands and items displays in the shop windows as well as on the pages of uh, magazines, uh, in the web pages, on the big ads covering the walls in our cities. All this stuff uh, doesn't allow people to articulate discourse, selection, choice among the meanings and goods. There is no more place for the reading and deciphering process, as Bourdieu, for example, described it 40 years ago. The process through which the beholder, we could even say the consumer, recognizes his or her intention, his or her meanings, then recognizes those of the work or of the goods and takes a decision what about he could do with it, accepting or adapting it in his or her meaning system, trying to change it or abandoning it. In a context of semiotic saturation, almost every adjustment among the older work and author has already been displayed in a standardized way so that people who feel uncomfortable with the situation try to escape from it. The second consequence connected to the first is that the most sophisticated consumers don't believe anymore to the claims and promises of the most important brands globally supplied and advertised. Who are the sophisticated consumers? 
those with quite a strong purchasing power and elaborated code, to use the Bernstein's expression. People that are used to selecting and choosing among many different items on the basis of knowledge accumulated through shopping experience, but also through social and cultural capital. These are the people at the highest levels of the social distinction ladder. So these people are searching for new fields of distinction where making valuable other characteristics they hold, as for example, specific and scarce cultural skills that make them members of a restricted and well-integrated world, for example, that of the art connoisseur. An hypothesis to be explored is consequently, and this is my second point, that the overlapping of art and fashion could be a field where a new form of social distinction can be experienced. An interesting feature of this hypothesis is that the field where art and fashion could overlap is not necessarily that of haute couture or that of very expensive, um, expensive pieces of clothing. The aspects that make interesting the artistic, so to say, fashion items are experimentation and research work embedded in these fashion items, as well as unexpected intense work to be dug out. Usually they are over of new talents, emergent designers, groups of interdisciplinary creative professionals. They are not available in the shopping centers. They ask an involvement that implicates relationships social circles, knowledge, and so on. I see, of course, that all of, um, all of these factors are strictly bound to the definition of social capital according to Bourdieu. But at the same time, I guess that the symbolic capital which is requested could be constructed through different trajectories that need to be explored, given the new sets of media, knowledge, skills that inhabit the field of creative production nowadays. The last point I would be interested in regards the ambivalent role of fashion in everyday life as factor both of continuity and discontinuity. I'll try to explain what I mean. In 1968, Bourdieu spoke about artistic competence as the previous knowledge of a set of stylistic indications that enable a representation to be located in the field of art, and the field of art was considered as separated from the field of everyday life and everyday objects. But are fashion items object of everyday life? It is disputable. <coughs> in a sense, they are that way, of course, because we wear more or less fashionable uh, pieces of clothing every day in every situation of our life. But at the same time, the most innovative pieces of clothing, those that have a very high cultural added value, those that are thought for special events and occasions, seem to have little to do with the everyday life. They allow the people who wear them to break with the order of everyday life. They allow them to perform in a different order of reality. We could suppose that people searching for a distinction based on the artistic content of fashion are trying to legitimize themselves as performers in a different order of reality than that of everyday life. If we accept this hypoth hypothesis, we can recognize the active role played by wearers who selecting a special item of an experimental collection take part in the creative process. As many fashion designers state, in fact, a piece of clothing doesn't live without somebody who wears it. On the clothes hanger, it is unfinished. If this is true, the implicit agreement between art fashion designers and their publics imply a social responsibility to produce together the meanings and the value of the work. And I would like to finish with this expression, the mutual social responsibility that links and ties creators and users accomplishing and fulfilling the value of the, of the work. In my opinion, this is the most interesting challenge and the commitment for the next more culturally and socially sustainable fashion, and maybe also a program for art. Thank you.
Victoria Alexander. All right, well, th uh, thank you very much. Um, I, I am an art sociologist, so we're moving across um, subdisciplines and disciplines in this panel. Um, and when I, when I kind of fell into being an art sociologist, I did this because I like art, because uh, visual art especially. Um, but as a sociologist, I have a certain luxury, which is that I usually um, give talks when there aren't artists there, there aren't curators there, there aren't people from the art world there, and I can be very critical and not have to worry about stepping on, on toes. Um, so th this round table, I, I hope, will, uh, will, be, will be good in terms of um, uh, creating a, a dialogue. Uh, because I feel very critical of the contemporary art world, um, a visual arts world, uh, while at the same time, um, I still kind of like parts of it. Um, and I think if I had given this talk a title, um, I would have called it something like, as goes capitalism, so goes art. Uh, my, my own area of, of expertise that I've done most of my research on has been on um, museums and galleries, art galleries, um, and um, how um, museums, through various kind of complex regimes, have moved from scholarly organizations where art historians um, were able to do what they wanted to do for other art historians and for people with a, a high degree of cultural capital to uh, organizations that need to be run like businesses, um, that focus on what we call in the United Kingdom enterprise culture, that need to be good at marketing, uh, and I know the UK and the US situation the best, but these kinds of things are happening across Europe, across the globe, in terms of art galleries and museums, in terms of cultural organizations, in terms of nonprofit organizations, educational organizations. We see it everywhere, and I think we see it everywhere because um, certain ways of organizing um, late capitalist economies tell us that this is the best way to run everything, which includes um, the arts. Um, but visual arts also um, have been um, consciously and unconsciously borrowing from um, capitalism as you get um, uh, bankers becoming um, rich and having lots of money to spend, they begin to see art um, as a good investment, and the more people that saw art as a good investment, the more people began to buy um, art closer and closer to when it was just produced, sort of the wet paint kind of sales of, of artwork fresh from the artist's studios as a very expensive um, kind of investment um, uh, that Francesca Bonami was sort of mentioning earlier. Um, and uh, auction prices are, 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 you know, there's always a new record, even um, less so in the, since the financial crisis, but even still. Of course, it only sets two people, to, takes two people to set uh, a record price at auction, uh, but as auction prices go up, as studio prices go up, um, it, it changes um, art, and art becomes um, more and more branded. So Emanuela with Moore was talking about branding and the semiotic saturation of, these, of this branding, and I think that branding is also occurring in the arts, so that artists become branded, um, uh, arts fairs become branded, um, the collectors are branded. Your art is, if you produce art, your art is worth more if it's collected by someone who's well known um, than by somebody who isn't well known. Um, and we, we all pretend uh, that, that art um, is, it has nothing to do with commerce, it's something separate. If you go talk to an art dealer, um, or as they prefer to be called, a gallerist, art dealer sounds like someone that, like, deals with money and selling, and that's not so good, so we, we, call, it, we call them gallerists. Um, they'll pretend that the money doesn't matter, um, but of course um, it does. Um, and as I, I think one of the things that's changed as prices have gone up is that dealers have to become um, more and more concerned with what happens if, um, if an investor, if, if a person who buys an artwork isn't a connoisseur, but is an investor who um, is looking for a quick profit, uh, if, um, if a collector buys a piece of work and then sells it at auction, um, 
Typically, we call this flipping. It's not good for the artist, it's not good for the gallery, but it may be good for the pocketbook of the person who flips the, the artwork. So I think that this um, is, is something to do with sort of, uh, you, you, you think about your own um, pocketbook, you don't think about what's gonna happen to, to a particular artist, or you don't think about the moral implications of, of buying work and selling it um, quickly. Um, and at the same time as sort of the price of artworks are, are going up and acting um, as, as um, signals, um, the art world also works on a winner-take-most um, system. Now, this has always been true that the most famous artists um, become more famous, the rich get richer. It's true in a lot of fields outside of art, but I think it's also uh, accelerating. Um, in, in the, the, the late 20th century and early 21st century. So, for instance, um, Damien Hirst is, is a household name, at least in the UK and the, the US. All of my students, all my undergraduate students, know who this person is. 98% um, I think recognize his name, and the, the last 2%, if you say sharks, they all know who you're talking about. So Damien Hirst is a wonderful um, teaching tool um, because every single student in the class knows um, wh who I'm talking about. Um, and um, it, it allows us to talk about a lot of different kinds of, kinds of debates. Um, and fitting with branding, I mean, Damien Hirst definitely is, he's a really smart guy and he's been working since the beginning of his career to um, promote himself as a brand. Um, other artists might like Takashi Murakami, um, blends, or as he calls it, flattens um, the, the boundaries between um, artistic, between art and commerce um, by, for instance, making designs for Louis Vuitton. So he, he, he has, um, my, my students don't, most of my students don't know the name Takashi Murakami, but they do recognize, if I show them a picture of the Louis Vuitton things, that a lot of them do recognize this. Um, and I think it's no coincidence that both of these artists work with um, great factories or with, um, uh, as, with, with a lot of assistance. Um, and I'm interested that Xavier was saying, was, you were talking about um, the studio as a small business. And I, I think that this is a, this here, here we have art and capitalism coming together in a, in a, in a new and different way, um, which hopefully produces really interesting work like yours, um, at, but maybe doesn't sometimes. Um, so, um, I think that these sort of household names of, of artists um, and the sort of the, the, the artistic A-listers um, is, is, uh, is, is something that's new. Now, of course, um, art's always been about money and power and prestige. I mean, the, the Medici in, in Renaissance Florence, of course, not, not that recently. Um, but artists are often said to have their fingers on the pulse um, of society, to reflect a zeitgeist. And if this is true, uh, what I would argue is that the beat that they reflect um, is capitalism and also the cult um, of celebrity. Um, but I was thinking about these things and I, what I was thinking is that the title of this session was I Make Art, I Make Art. And I, I've, I've made a little bit of art on my thing, there was a little typo on my name, so I've made some art myself. Uh, and I was, I was interested in the idea of I making art because if it's, if it's the, the person making art, is this, are we talking about artists or are we talking about um, the, the consumers who are creating the meanings of art? And um, I, I also thought I'd like to conclude on um, the idea of, of the prosumer. And a prosumer is a, is, a, is a term that some of you will be very familiar with. It's a producer and a consumer. And what usually this is through sort of internet um, types of, of um, activities where people um, write fan fiction, where people create visual works, um, and um, they also, you know, put them on the web, put them on YouTube, put them in various different locations uh, for other people to, to look at. So you're both producing and consuming um, at the same time. And what I think that this does, when I, when I was thinking about the, the, the topic, I was thinking about, you know, sort of fine arts 
Um, and we learned from, from Bourdieu that um, the fine arts, um, uh, you know, are, are uh, autonomous, and whereas popular arts are, are heteronymous, so there's lots of commercial influence in the popular arts, but the fine arts are, are pure. Um, but of course, the fine arts aren't pure, um, and the boundaries between them, between the fine arts and the popular arts is probably closer than we think. But with um, lots of new technologies coming in, I was just, um, um, Xavier has, a, has an iPad, and I, well, I'm, I don't have one yet, but when I get one, I want to get this application called Brushes, where you can make, make paintings on the screen. Um, and David Hockney apparently uses this, and then I can use it, and I can make art as well. But I think that, there, that, that art might change a lot with a change in technology, not at the sort of the high flying level, but at the level of um, individuals, and that, that people were, are not, are, are going to be producing more art, a lot of it pretty poor, but it will be more like folk art, where lots of people perhaps are involved. And I think, um, to conclude, this idea of, of, um, of as goes capitalism, so goes art, um, and how much, um, uh, money is involved um, I in the art world, it, it changes meanings. We, um, we've, we've, already, we've already talked about Benjamin in the age of um, art, in uh, art in the age of mechanical reproduction. If you have copies of work, you look at work as, as an original of a copy rather than confronting it as if it's a new thing. That's what Benjamin argued. And what, um, what I argue is that if, uh, and if, if you know how much something costs, um, it changes your um, opinion of it. Uh, and when I, when I read about some of the um, high finance in the, in the art world, I, I have a sense of distaste often. And the sense of distaste I get is not because um, the pure, autonomous, fine arts are contaminated by commercial culture, um, but that there's a sense of social exclusion, that if you're rich, you can have art, but if you're um, a very ordinary person, you can't in the same kind of way. And I, I think that's a shame. Uh, and I'll, I'll stop there so we can let the next speaker go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now Volker Kierberg, who will talk about that's what you're going to talk about, that maybe you've changed your mind by now. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to the panel. Um, I make art. Well, I don't talk really so much about I make art. I talk about I consume art. Well, I don't even talk about so much about I consume art. I will talk more about I experience art. So I guess that's the point I will talk about. And, but it's, it's even that is close to, uh, especially to what uh, Vicky just said, when she mentioned Damien Hirst's shark, I, talked, I thought about is it art? Yes, of course, now it is art. Because as I just noticed this summer when I visited the Metropolitan Museum of Art, it's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, therefore it is good art. There's no doubt about that, isn't it? Okay, uh, I'm, also, uh, I'm also an art sociologist, but I'm also a museum sociologist. So I try to link art museums and experiencing art in art museums. And uh, what I did in this case is really trying to... You oh, it does. Okay. Uh, I will talk a little bit, and I'll try to be very empirical. I know you are, a lot of you are probably a little bit tired by now, so I will not be too theoretical. I will very much work with the empirical study that I and a team of us um, uh, conducted in uh, an art museum in St. Gallen in Switzerland, and it's the Emotion Project, and that researches the museum-going experience. At the heart of the project is the investigation of the psychogeographical effect of the art museum on the visitor. Museum visitors who took part in this project were given insights in their own art perception as well as their psychological reactions to this museum and to the museum visits. Um, it's a field phase that took part in the summer of 2009 and we are still working on analyzing it. 
the core of our interest is the relationship between art objects, their curatorial installation, and the effects on the visitors. Gaining access to this complex realm of visitor reception in the museum requires both interdisciplinary research methods and an innovative technical apparatus. Visitors who took part in the project received a wristband at the exhibition entrance that included several signaling and measurement sensors. The wristband device allowed for the precise measurement of the tracks of the path of each visitor through the exhibition, their speed, their time spent in front of a picture, when and how strong an emotional arousal occurred, by measuring their changing skin conductivity, the galvanic skin resistance, and lastly, when and how strong a cognitive arousal occurred by measuring their changing heartbeat. This immense amount of data has been further validated by several social research survey phases, for instance, face-to-face -face entrance and exit surveys, and a delayed online survey weeks after the visit. This is like Strada More. Okay. Uh, we we'll talk about this later. Uh, what you see here is that actually this uh, visitor has a has a glove on the right and on their on her right hand, and this is the one that is measuring all these physiological reactions and sending them right away to a box, receiving it, and then immediately calculating it into a computer and printing out later um, a visualization of her or his museum visit. So you can actually see how it is. This is probably one of them. This is not one, but these are eight different visitors. And if the, there are certain lines, uh, the, the, the green part are, um, are the artworks. If it's very dark, people tend to stand in front of it lay longer. If it's a little bit lighter, they don't tend to stand in front of longer. Uh, the lines are the trackings, the way how they walk through the exhibition. If it's a dark line, they go slow. If it's a light, it's a light gray line, they, they went faster through the exhibition. If you see, you see red and yellow blotches, the yellow blotches are cognitive arousals, the red blotches are emotional arousals. And the question is, does it appear in front of certain uh, exhibit, exhibits or not? Uh, this, this collection is a very typical and actually quite plain collection of most of it museum, uh, modern art, classical modernity. Quite a lot of the works come from famous artists such as Hans Arp, Max Ernst, Fernand Leger, Laszlo Mohorje Nagy, Le Corbusier, or Sophie Teuber Art. Due to the eclectic mixture of the St. Gallen collection, the exhibition also consisted of works from the pop art area, for instance, Andy Warhol Campbell's Condensed Tomato Soup, or also from contemporary artists like Günther Uecker, Imi Knöbel or On Kavara. Uh, I just want to point out On Kavara, that is the one in the, in the uh, distant wall, these uh, six different uh, uh, paintings that all of them have dates on it, just dates. And I want to come back to this in a moment. Uh, but this is not really the topic of this paper, or this talk. <laughs> Specifically for this exhibition, Netko Salakov created an own artwork, a label level. This was the title of an invention of 32 handwritten one-line uh, one statements, for instance, most of them small, partially visible, partially almost hidden texts at the walls of the exhibition halls. These little f written uh, scribblings uh, with a felt pen were sometimes only half a centimeter high. And this is, for instance, an intervention. So he, he, may, he, he scribbled little men at the wall, between the pictures, for instance. Um, but also, Solokov commented directly on exhibited works, artists, framings, and ways of hanging works. Like this, for instance, which is close to a window where you could, from the exhibition, look out and see uh, the nature in, uh, at the St. Gallen Park. Um, also, he commented on small bumps in the otherwise flawless white wall. And um, this is, for instance, close to a, a, a painting by Moholy Nagy, 
where he really commented, so this must be very difficult to do something constructivist like this. Um, the invitation I make art assumes that not only the art producer but also the art perceiver knows this is art. Many papers and studies emphasize that if it is exhibited in the consecrated walls of an art museum, it must be art. Now, Solakov's texts are located in these holy halls, but they avoid by form and content any appearance of consecrated art. As a part of the emotion study, we were now interested on who would perceive Solakov's statements as art and who would not. Um, yes, I'm a little bit tired too. Um, as a part of this study, we were interested now in this, but we also uh, measured how visitors reacted specifically on, uh, on an emotional and a cognitive level to these uh, texts. Now, is it art or is it not? Well, quite interesting, we had a considerable number of visitors, more than one third, who decided, no, it is not art. About two thirds of them decided it is art. Um, who are the ones who deny these scribblings their art status, although they are part of an art exhibition in an art museum? The first way to find an answer to this question is to compare the art deniers to the ones that see the text as art. Now, I don't want to go too much in the methods, but of course we did exit entrance and exit surveys. We, knew, we know quite a lot about the social economic characteristics of our visitors, uh, uh, of all these people that we also measured biometrically. And so we could do a simple uh, regression analysis examining how much standard social economic characteristics like gender, age, where they live, uh, education of course, profession, and also an index that we developed ourselves, an index of art affinity, and how much that could predict whether uh, th these visitors would fall into the art category or in the non-art category. Uh, quite clear, it is, uh, it is not so clear. So we were quite surprised, we thought it makes a lot of sense. Um, this is actually the Onkawara uh, comment of, of uh, Sokolov. That's the day when he did the scribblings. Um, the only ones, the only somewhat, not even significant, but in the tendency significant uh, uh, was, the, uh, was education, and only the difference between people who have a graduate degree and people who don't have a graduate degree. Of course, art museum visitors, in, as everybody knows, is, are very well educated. Now, we had uh, uh, educated people, and those educated people with a, with a university degree denied, more or less, Solokov the art status. The ones without an uh, educated uh, degree uh, affirmed it. Uh, another, but I want to emphasize that this is a very weak explanation and we couldn't really find with respect to the standard classical status any other explanation of why people decided this is art or this is not art. Uh, the uh, emotional, I know the time is running, uh, the emotional part of um, the, the emotional um, experience was certainly interesting and very positive despite, or in, uh, in, uh, despite uh, whether people decided it is art or not art, they liked it. They liked the humor. They, they were very pleased with this, with this uh, part. Uh, even though if they decided it is not art, it was still a part of, and I would use the word very considerate, as of a spectacle, even though it was a very small spectacle. But it helped the people to enjoy the visit of the art museum, probably more than any of the other uh, art exhibits that were shown at this art exhibition. And that's something to shorten this a little bit. Uh, uh, that's something that, that we found out in our post-visit survey. Three to six weeks after the visit, we contacted the visitors again, and I don't want to go too much into how we did that, but we were able to get a considerable, and, and that's very important, a very uh, uh, a significantly representative survey of the normal visitors that we interviewed while they were in the exhibition. We could also interview a part of them three to six weeks after the exhibition. And in fact, when we asked them, we asked three different questions. What do you remember in general? Uh, what do you remember with respect to artworks and 
who are the artists you remember most? It was, first of all, what do you remember in general? Not surprisingly, our survey. So people actually uh, came there and, and I, we know that some of the people, not, not a small amount of them, came because of our survey. It became actually pretty famous because they dis, uh, discussed it. But uh, apart from that, the very first art that was remembered all the time were the Solokov uh, um, experiences. Not Andy Warhol, not Edward Munch, not uh, Ferdinand Hodler, not any of the famous artists. No, this was what the people remember if they were asked about what kind of art do you have. Um, so, uh, my last slide. Um, Giving him art status or not doesn't matter when remembering him. It doesn't matter, people enjoyed it and they didn't care whether it is art or not. Uh, education plays a less significant role than we thought it would. It played a role in the way that you might think of it playing it. The educated people regarded it not as much as art as the uneducated people. Be sorry for saying educated now. Uh, just a small note at the end is, and I have no explanation, and maybe you have one, gender has a significant effect. Men in general remember the Solokov much more than women. Uh, who knows why? Uh, uh, it, but uh, that's, that's a question, I don't want that you answer this, maybe you have an answer, maybe you have an idea about it, but I think it's um, important just to, to think about that Art or not art is something that you cannot explain by standardized traditional socioeconomic characteristics. Thank you very much. Well, we, we don't have the answers yet, but we have a, a step in a direction, and uh, Annalisa Tota is going to show us some more. And finally, Stefano is going to conclude the basis of everything that he's heard so far. So thank you. And uh, it was a very long day. We, you look exhausted. I am also exhausted, so I will be very, very brief. A fantastic dinner is waiting for us upstairs, <laughs> so I will be brief, <laughs> okay? And thinking about uh, what I could say, I thought that uh, a brief uh, contribution, uh, but useful, could be about the social uses of arts, for which purposes the arts are used. And uh, I will try, very briefly, in seven minutes, let's say, to make some general reflection on this very general point. You will say, mission impossible. No, I will try to do it. And uh, perhaps I, I, will not, I will just uh, provide some suggestion. Of course, I will not be exhaustive and so on. Uh, so, a first, how does it work? Okay. Uh, a first uh, main dimension, in order to reflect on the social uses of the arts, could be arts and public space. And here I have taken some pictures in the Biennale Architettura, and I found that they could be interesting for us. How can you use architecture to add value to the public space? And then, sorry. How can we promote social inclusion through urban planning? And then. How can we create urban space that encourages physical activity in a compact city and so on? No? Just to have some suggestion in the direction uh, arts and public space. And then another main direction could be, of course, arts and public discourse. As an example of this direction, I, I am quoting a very important exhibition uh, which was held here in Milan at PAC, the Museum of Contemporary Art. Uh, it was on the work of, uh, on the artwork of the Chinese artist Sun Huan, and it was here in September. And here, uh, the artwork by uh, the artist Sun Huan are very peculiar, according to my point of view. Uh, they really, uh, they really provoke debate 
in the public discourse. It's just an example. Of course, I could have uh, selected many other artists. And if you don't know his work, but I, I'm sure you know because it's very, very well known, you can have an idea. This is another one. As you see, it's a sort of artwork really adequate to provoke debate, to, uh, to provoke uh, our common sense ideas about some, some issues. Eh? And this is even more provocative. And then, of course, I, 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 I had to mention Maurizio Catalan and his very, his, uh, very controversial style. And uh, in the last week, we had here in Milan a big controversy about the new exhibition uh, on the work, on the artwork uh, by Maurizio Catalan, and uh, I'm sure you all know this very important artwork by him. And uh, the, the controversy, if you haven't read about this, it was that this image um, should be used for the poster for advertising the exhibition, and there was of course a big controversy about this. And this is a very another example. Perhaps you remember this, it was also here in Milan, and it was in a piazza here nearby, and then it was, uh, if I remember well, five years ago, and uh, someone passing by was trying to save some of the children, who are uh, obviously not real, and uh, this person fell down and broke a leg, and then there was a big controversy and so on, perhaps you remember it. And then, Another dimension, very well known, is the relation between arts and the cultural shape of the past. As I've been working for men, the last 10 years about this, I just, uh, I just thought to, uh, to say something, but not to, to find example. Memorials for the victims of terrorists, public inscription against mafia, war memorials, and so on. And, uh, sorry. Ah, you cannot read upstairs, sorry. And then, uh, okay, uh, a fourth dimension, arts as means to deconstruct the object of everyday life. And this, for example, you can see uh, that uh, object of everyday life I use in a very different way. For example, I do not know if it, clear, if it can be clear from the image, but uh, up there, you can see the small umbrella that I use for the ice cream, and they are assembled in a work of art, and they uh, acquire new meanings. Uh, and this is also a very interesting dimension, and this is another example. They are pencil. You see? They are. And they are used to create to have a, a big variation in the space. And here, and ah, uh, sorry, another one, those are used pencils collected in all the schools and, uh, and they become a work of art. And here again, hanging. And then another important dimension to reflect on the relation uh, between arts and its, and its social uses can be the relation between arts and metaphysical meanings. And again, I would like to quote uh, the artwork uh, by Tsung Wan, the Berlin Buddha, which is a four meter ice sculpture made from compacted incense ash. And perhaps uh, you know that ash is a very uh, specific material. Uh, for example, there are uh, some uh, study trying to understand why, because ash is considered a sort of material between death and life, and so uh, there are studies trying to understand which kind uh, of material it is, and if you are using ash, as uh, Tsang Wan is doing to, to create uh, artworks, uh, it's, uh, it's something very, very peculiar. Also, the fact of the artwork become very, very peculiar. And then, I'm brief, I'm, I'm coming to my conclusion. <laughs> uh, the last point is I make art, uh, and so I was trying to reflect on this point, and I, I thought we can think about it at least in three levels. The first one is uh, the level we know very well as sociologists of the arts. I'm producing the meaning of the artwork. Hmm? Umberto Eco, in garden, and so on, and so on, and so on. Very well known in the, in the uh, sociological analysis of the artwork. Then we have a second level. I make art 
It can mean that uh, as a receiver, I'm participating to the, I'm practically participating to the creation of the artwork because, for example, I can select among different parts inscribed in the artwork. And so, according to my specific fruition, I will uh, uh, actualize a different artwork. And then there is a, a third level, which uh, I think uh, it's very interesting. And I found an example in dance. Danza Sensibile by Claude Coldy. What is this? Uh, we could translate it as uh, dance in nature. And here, in this case, uh, the distinction between artist and public collapse because there is no public and because uh, artistic code, the dance in, in this case, is used uh, to experience the world in a very different way. And there are not the performance uh, of uh, dance in the nature, in this, in, uh, of danza sensibile. It is just that you are doing it, but you are using dance, for example, um, to change your gaze because uh, dance in nature means to make dance, for example, on olive trees, or on the sand, or in the sea, in the water, and so on. And so, through the activity of making art, making dance, you totally change your gaze, you totally change the way you are listening to the sounds. And when you are coming back to everyday life, the way you are perceiving sounds has changed. And so I thought that this could be a sort of uh, new trend. It's something interesting because uh, it's a social use of artistic code different from what we are used to. And I can finish here. Thank you very much for your attention. And finally, uh, yeah. Stefano. Yeah. Thank you for staying here. Um, I, I am confused. I, 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 I raised some question and, and, um, and I felt uh, some answer. I felt an artist that is saying, yes, it's changing and it's positive. I'm happy about what is happening because art is important and, and I can develop and I, and I, uh, and I earn my life and I'm, and I'm quite happy. And, and then I, I heard Francesco Bonami that said that everything is much more difficult and, and, and the rules change it, but without making a judgment about that. And I, I think we have to take this like absence of judgment. And then, and then I'm afraid, you, you, you know, I, I, I love you all very much, but, but I mean, I think that the other side, the social scientists, are not, we are not, I mean, I, I'm not understanding exactly what is happening. They perceive that the changing is going on, but we are not explaining what is going on. We, we didn't explain what is going on. We, we, are, we are going around a little bit scat scattered, but we don't explain what is going on. And, 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 uh, and so while I was listening, for example, to the, to the Falker, Wonderful, I mean, admirable job. And I, and I was telling to myself, but it is, it is not important to, to establish the perception of people in order to decide if something is art or not. I think we are, comp this, this exercise, which is very nice, I mean, to, seems to be completely unrelevant in a sense. And, 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 uh, and, um, and, and then I, I said, probably I'm wrong. Uh, of course, uh, why I am wrong? Because because um, because this is a sign of how things are changing. The fact that there are people that are spending this energy, the wonderful scientific apparatus, in order to let us really understanding what the people are feeling in front of a work of art. This is something that maybe ten years ago would be inconceivable. And, uh, and the fact that now something like this is happening is really a huge sign of how the arts, the meaning of, the, of art and the kind of the relationship with, that art may have with the social environment and with other lives is changing. And, and which is the sign of this changing? It is 
much more related to, to what I expect to, to, to have in a kind of, let's say, marketing test experience. And, and, this is, and this is, I mean, acceptable. I don't want to make any moral judgment. I mean, it's acceptable that we treat art with a strict marketing, let's say, tool and competences in a cynical way, and that's it. But then I say, if we do this, we have to make a choice. We, we, we are making a choice. And, and I think that this choice is in front of us, in front of the artist, in front of the curator. And, and, and then I was thinking, I have to make a choice. Art may be something which is with the marketing tool or not. And I was really unhappy with this choice because I said, no. I don't have to make any choice. And, and probably what is happening is simply that, because I, I was afraid, we are killing the, the, the golden goose. We are, we are killing the golden goose because they are, how can the erratic value of art, how, how can the, 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 the thing which is inside be preserved if you are going on in such a way? Because it, it will be like buying a car. And, 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 and then I said, no, probably it's not like that. Probably there will be, uh, the arts will surprise us. And, and, and probably arts will find a way uh, to, 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 be, to be itself in a, in a different situation. Probably we will see a restructuring of the art system. Probably it, will, it cannot go on like this. We, we cannot depend on the 200 galleries of Basel uh, long more like it was in the past. Maybe, I mean, maybe there will be huge changes and maybe the goose will, be, will become a chicken or something different, but, but then, but, but then uh, the, the, the eggs will be, still be uh, the eggs. I am afraid, Francesco, maybe, I'm, I'm afraid that maybe the, the golden part will be only a color and not a... But I, I know that this question is completely uh, impossible to demonstrate and to talk about. Um, uh, we, we really don't. Like to respond. Uh, and if not, if, if there are no questions from the panelists, question? Yes. Uh, do we Very louder, much louder. Thanks a lot. So very shortly, in a, in a form of a provocation, uh, this has been, I mean, in the case of uh, practitioners who have been uh, uh, on this panel, um, one should not forget that this is one angle, one take on the art world. And uh, for me, this is an exquisite example of uh, the uh, art of unsustainability. Uh, the the, I mean, Mr. Bonani has written a text in uh, the catalogue of greenwashing in 2008, which, uh, I mean, I will not comment on it in details, but you can look into that text uh, to find, I think, an exquisite case of uh, a superficial, unsustainable discourse, but okay. Um, there's not only this category, I mean, Mr. Bonami proposed a categorization with, you know, on the one hand, the, uh, the art with the collectors, on the other hand, the biennales, Another way to phrase it, or another way to frame it, could be also to see this fortress of a certain kind of already actually old high art 
uh, as one category of, let's say, unsustainable high arts, and uh, many other uh, practices as being a totally different understanding and definition of art. Just one example, I'm thinking of what the group Wochenklausur is doing in uh, uh, Austria, for example, or some uh, artists in, within, inside this room who have different approaches, also taking into account, of course, a different definition of quality, of course, uh, uh, than looking at JPEG pictures. If there are no more <coughs> pardon me, comments, then I would like to say that uh, I think that we're in a, a world which is really full of enormous changes and uh, I don't know if they're revolutionary. This was a question that I asked at the And I don't think that this is a revolution, but I think that what we're seeing is a very close uh, connection as Vicky Alexander has pointed out, between the world of uh, business and the world of art, and maybe it's more overt than it was in the past. I think that it is correct that it, it, it has existed for a long time, um, and uh, there is that aspect. The second thing I would like to say is that what, what can we say about the world of uh, the, the art that is being made by artists who are not making objects that can be easily sold as commodities. This was uh, uh, for, for a certain amount of time in the world of uh, popular music, of uh, rock music, for example. Uh, it was an attempt by uh, certain young, usually young artists, young performers, to make a form of musical production uh, that was so, so uh, off-putting that no one would buy it and they would save the world of music from the, the uh, danger of commercial art. Uh, and uh, for a time they did, except that their work has now become collected, not in museums, but collected. Some of it is actually collected in museums, but uh, for the most part, it is, they made a statement and it was the statement that was important, not the sound of the music that they created. Uh, and I think that uh, in the world of the kind of art that used to be found in museums, uh, that is one whole range of visual art, but there is also a large range of visual art which is not very suited for museum display because it is, involves time not only space, but time. That is, it is art which is uh, using visual technologies, and uh, this visual technologies includes movies, it includes video art, and it includes technologies which change so rapidly that museums are, practically speaking, unable to preserve them as works. Uh, and yet, these are all experiments that are going on. A number of years ago, uh, when I was looking at what were the, uh, what were the, in, uh, the criteria used by certain Western European governments uh, which uh, wanted to uh, help to, in, to encourage art, art creation, art production, if you like, the one, the one term that they were able to agree on in their ministries of culture were, was the, to, the uh, criterion of innovation. Innovation, and this has been, uh, uh, this has been one, one of the things that we think about as an important uh, basis for contemporary art. But of course with innovation that does not tell you what it is that you are making or seeing. And uh, I think that in this session, we have actually opened a can of worms. And the can of worms really is, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an image in a sense, which sounds very negative, but in a way, I think it is a, a way of uh, forcing us to think more 
of what it is that art is, what is the art world that we're talking about, and we have not answered whether we're happy with it or not. The people who were the respondents to Volker Kirchberg's study have told us something. They've told us what I saw in New York in the past year when at least three of the contemporary art museums were having a kind of art which was performance, which we used to call performance, which uh, uh, Segal would not call performance. He would call it something else, like interaction. Situation. Situation, interaction, but basically an interaction of the artist with the visitor. And this really is a question. Is it that the visual art that's being created is not satisfying enough to artists that they are willing to make that kind of art, but instead they are making a museum which used to be a place which was a quiet place where works of art hung on the walls or stood on plinths and didn't move. And now we have something totally different and I can tell you that the crowds that were surrounding the MoMA and the crowds that were surrounding the Guggenheim and the Whitney were unbelievable. I have not seen such crowds since the, I guess it was since the MoMA showed a full exhibition, the entire building, the old building, which was smaller but still full, of Picassos. And uh, now it comes for people who are doing active interactions with a public. And uh, I don't know what the future is, and I hope that we can all think about it. Thank you for being very patient. Thank you.